Well, the main difference is that they are more severe and, uh, and uh, more unfair and more unjust. The difference is that his dream about the beneficiaries of his own uh, kind, his own brand of austerity politics, is that uh, it should be a national bourgeoisie and the kind of authoritarian Hungarian Catholic white upper middle class that should benefit, which actually won't. And you know that's that that's a miscalculation, because in this in this economic system, of course, it will be still the multinationals and you know you know the the, the, the rapport de force, you know the the power relationships. Uh, are really quite uh, rigid uh, at this time. It won't be ever. And you know the problem in, in Hungary. You know I really don't like to talk very much about it because it's so bleak and so grim. But um, is that uh, the criticism of uh, Orbán's anti-democratic uh, policies came from various European institutions? together with the pressure towards austerity uh, policies. So when, you know, nowadays the, the liberal position in Hungary, and everybody is basically in the official opposition is, apart from the fascists, is liberal, um, I would say that, you know, this is the European idea, you know, uh, freedom and hunger, and that is bound to be unpopular. So, so now, indeed, Orban, who at least in words uh, resists this uh, neoliberal onslaught from the European Union and from other Western circles of this kind, appears as uh, the defender of the national interest, which of course is a lie. Nevertheless, he's exploiting this very adroitly. He's a very adept and intelligent politician and he knows how to do it, so he's quite popular still, in spite of, well, popular, about 30% of the population is satisfied with his performance, but that's more than uh, can be said for the socialist politicians in their position, unfortunately. And um, so it, this shows very well that uh, this kind of uh, enlightened absolutism inherited from the Habsburgs, that is characteristic for the European institutions, uh, which is a mix of benevolent uh, tyranny uh, and uh, a juristic way of seeing public liberties and the combination of uh, a very dogmatic economic policy, well, that is uh, rejected by the population and together with this, elements of public freedom and social rights are rejected as well. So it's an unholy mix, but the you know, mix is presented to the people, which meaning that if you want freedom, you have to accept this package. And people say, the hell will accept this package. I don't either, you know. So in, in, in one respect, I do understand my compatriots. So, uh, that, you know, the fact that they are still supporting Mr. Orban doesn't prove that they are dumb. They have to, to, to choose between two evils. And God knows it's not easy to choose between those two evils. They are choosing one, I don't choose either, but, but I can't, can't say that you know, we are faced with uh, noble knights from Brussels and Berlin and Paris and Washington, ben hell bent to save the Hungarian peasant. Of course not, of course not. Yes, because you know that's, 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 that's the, the, the question is that do do we oppose the anomalies of capitalism or capitalism itself? So you know, corruption is vastly overrated. Of course, it can reach proportions in which, of course, the, even the normal functioning of a capitalist so-called democracy is made impossible. It has happened, but but that's that's the exception. And the fact is that most of the oppressive intolerable, unjust, unfair uh, rules that we have to submit to are in the public domain, are official and public acts 
of national parliaments, international bodies, courts of law, um, uh, public agreements within, between various social actors and so on and so forth. So to, uh, to uh, disseminate the idea that our problems, including the crisis, is due to some secret, invisible factor, be that anything, is very dangerous, not because of only a fascist paranoia, which of course is there, but also because it's wrong, because it's simply wrong. And what we have to oppose is not some extraordinary occult or new power, but the power, the power structures that exist. What we are opposed to are you know, governments and armies and courts and police forces and international banks and uh, UN and WTO and IMF and World Bank and European Union and so on. All these are you know, perfectly legal and uh, out in the open public institutions. Uh, there's no secret. So that's, that's, that's my bad news. You know, there's no secret. It, it, uh, 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 the social aspect, the social feature of the former European construction on the, on the, you know, the welfare state dispensation before 1989, uh, that has disappeared. So there are imbalances. Uh, but all this social legislation has disappeared and it has been made possible by a political mobilization uh, against uh, those who for their livelihood are dependent on public assistance. And those are approaching to become the majority, even in rich countries such as ours, because even we, as compared to Africa, we are of course rich countries. and uh, And uh, more and more, more and more people, more and more people are dependent on the state for their livelihood and for their normal conduct of life, education, health, etc., etc. And the state is more and more publicly and openly reluctant to uh, ensure the most elementary condition of a civilized life, which is to be fed and to have a roof over one's head and to get, you know, your aspirin if you have a bloody headache. And this is not any longer considered to be one of the public duties of a good government. Well, that's indeed a change, but that's a change that happened during a, a transition period of 40 years. So there were plenty of occasion to observe it and to fight it. It's not a sudden recent conspiracy. It has been, you know, since Mrs. Thatcher took office in 79, that was 40 years ago. Look, I mean, uh, that this is not only tactics, but of course, uh, the human rights is, is, is the bourgeois order at its best. And it is the language of the Enlightenment, is the language of the 18th century, of the French Revolution. It's part of, of course, a progressive tradition. Uh, though, you know, I don't, I don't have contempt for this. But of course, obviously, uh, this is part of uh, uh, a social order in which uh, uh, individuals are uh, conceived of uh, in an abstract way in which there's a legal order which ensures that citizens between each other in some respects are strictly equal and that kind of equality in rights uh, should be defended by public authority. If this were the case it would be wonderful but of course it, but it cannot be the case because it, all this is combined with an oppressive order on another level, on the level uh, on which uh, what is considered a private affair of anybody, that is work, production, consumption, well, these are considered not to be public affairs, con these are considered to be contractual affairs between private individuals that they can arrange as they want which is, of course, the prime 
mendacity of all bourgeois society, because of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, political struggle doesn't stop at the factory gate or at the office door. And, uh, but of course, bourgeois society stops there and we shouldn't. So in a way, if you want, you can formulate it that way, that class struggle uh, conducted in the spirit of liberation is an enlargement, a generalization of the emancipatory idea of the Enlightenment, which I don't have a degree with, but this was one of the lines of, of leftist movements in the 20th century, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's superficial because we have problems with Enlightenment, but, <coughs> but most certainly this is more than tactics. So we just can tell the bourgeois society if they declare human rights, they should first, of course, observe it and to respect them, and because if indeed observed, it will lead out of the bourgeois society, if it's really, really observed. But of course it's observed only in the breach, and, uh, and it, is, it is abused, and its enlargement for social rights have been retrenched. So we don't have social rights any longer. That's in most countries of the world, uh, progressive social legislation has been withdrawn and denied, and uh, so there's, there's a moment in which indeed international solidarity and common fights are on the order of the day, because it's everywhere, it's in a, in a desperate, desperate uh, position.